learn here in the next couple of weeks that churches are shifting from that at an alarming rate, and they're they're, they're having experience over scripture, and uh, your feelings or your something happened to your dream or some fool thing like that. But I don't know about you, but that's not a very safe position to take. You liable to believe or dream anything this in this generation. We better stand on what we know has been right all these years. Say it out on a second. Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Help me say Standing, standing Standing on the promises God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God. On the third, ready. Standing on the promises I now can see. Perfect presence cleansing in the blood for me. Standing in liberty, Christ makes free. Standing on the promises of God. Come on Standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. On the fourth, say it out. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. Oh. Promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. All right, one more. Get this one good now. Everybody, ready? Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior, my all in all. Standing on the promises, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you. All right, I'm letting that video run up a little bit behind me now because I keep keep getting it on the right spot, and then it don't want to it don't want to it wants to start all over again. So I'm gonna let it run for a few more minutes here. We get back where we left off last week and show a little bit more of tonight. But I hope everybody's had a real good week. Glad you're here. Say amen, man. It has it was seventy yesterday in short sleeves, and tonight twenty. Uh, that, that's January. And I guess we'll take it, won't we? And God's been good to us. The Lord's been good to you, been good to me. The Lord has already given us a great start to the new year. It really has. A uh, couple quick announcements now. Um, we had planned on taking some of our bus kids down to the bus service down at, at um, in Kings Mountain Saturday night. Uh, but I, the weather, you know, obviously can't take a bus when it's bad weather, but we might have to take my forerunner and stuff if that's still, I, I can't say one way or the other yet. They're saying right now over in Asheville that it can be slow, uh, sleet, snow, and rain mixed together. I'll tell you what that is. They do that every year. Every year, as long as I can remember, once it snows, from then on, boy, it's every time you turn around, it's snow, snow, snow. And where we are, we'll wind up getting rain. And so that's maybe what happened. You know, it might be. might be bad. Who knows? But I've seen it over and over and over where they, once it snows, buddy, it's every week from then on. And uh, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Uh, but um, I will say if it is icy and snowy, of, of course we'll have church. But we may not begin the video series until the following Sunday night when everybody can be here. Uh, that's, <coughs> excuse me, the only change it'll make in our plans here, maybe. And uh, if it's just a little bit bad, we'll go ahead and begin. But I, I've been looking forward to it. Got a text from a 
preacher in Georgia a while ago saying, are you still going to do that video series? And I said, yep, coming up soon. So a lot of people's waiting on it. And uh, you pray. Uh, the Lord put it on my heart some time ago to get everything that's right. The King James Bible, a true right kind of worship, right kind of music. You want to get all that stuff. I want it all down and documented and researched and on video and everything. So if I ever die, uh, my grandkids will know what's right. And uh, Lord knows, buddy, we're a dying breed, y'all. We are, I'm telling you. And a lot of people say, well, don't you want to get with what God's doing now? I sure do. Sure do. I just don't believe he's doing that. I don't believe he's doing that stuff. And I'll prove it here in the next few weeks. So uh, let's pray about that. Pray God will help us. In another 20 years, you're going, you ain't going to find a, much of a Bible-believing church. I'm telling you there, uh, unless the Lord raise up some young preachers, and thank God there are some, but uh, they're, they're falling out like flies. So let's let's pray tonight. Let's remember praying for Brother Wayne. He texted me a while ago and said he's still under the weather. He said he coughs and coughs and been to the doctor and can't quit coughing. And, uh, and then Miss Sandy, you know, battling that cancer. Let's pray for her and others that need our prayers tonight. Got a lot of special requests. A lot of special requests. A lot of us have kids and grandkids and, and people we work with and neighbors that need prayer tonight. Let's pray for those that had to work that can't be here. Uh, Jeremy, one of our deacons, he can't be here tonight because of work. And and uh, let's pray for people that really, really would be here and their hearts here, but they can't be. You got something on your heart? Let's pray for them. Let's do that right now. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads and our hearts before you this evening, Lord, we thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for our health and our strength and all the many, many, many blessings of life, Lord, that you've given us. We come before you this, this evening asking forgiveness of all of our sins, everything we've done wrong, everything we've said, every step we took, every word we've spoke that's not right. God, forgive us. Wash us in the blood and give us a fresh, brand new, clean start here this evening. I thank you for everybody that's here tonight. Lord, you saw these hands that were lifted. You know who they are, where they are, what they are. And I pray you meet the need of every single life here tonight. Oh, Lord, do what ought to be done here this evening. I pray, God, you'd save lost souls. There'll be that one of those here tonight who's not saved or not sure. This will be the night when they settle it once and for all. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd help those that are uh, backslid, cold, and indifferent, Lord. I pray you'd send mighty revival, God, in our in this day and time. Lord God, I pray for those that are sick, not able to get out here tonight. Bless them. Bless these services that go across the country. Lord, bless every preacher and pastor, evangelist, missionary, anybody, anywhere trying to do something for you. Now, have you in our hearts tonight. Do what ought to be done. We'll thank you and praise you for what you do. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, let's all stand now. We'll have our ushers come and we'll go ahead and have our offering tonight. And I tell you what we'll do. We'll let the kids go early tonight and we'll we'll try to get right in, in on into our, our service tonight. So uh, uh, ushers, come on right quick now and let's let's get this offering right quick. Would you do that? Uh, everybody give this evening, honor the Lord and uh, he'll bless you for it. And if you didn't get your offering in uh, Sunday, uh, get it in the night, okay? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thanks so much for all you've done for us. Pray now that you'd bless this offering this tonight. I pray God, the Holy Ghost, touch every single heart here this evening. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids, you are not dismissed. Not yet. Not yet. things right quick now and we're going to get right into this because I'm about to where I want to be here tonight pick up where we left off last week this is a, a video on the history of the greatest book in the world King James Bible and we've been studying it here for the last few weeks so I thought I'd show a little bit of this tonight and I'm going to talk a little bit about it too um, uh, so uh, I hope everybody be ready to get right into it. We got up right to the time. I've just been showing some of the great preachers, uh, 
the fruits of the King James Bible. No other book has been even close being responsible for as many people being saved for revival as your King James Bible. And I'm telling you, folks, a uh, preacher just called me Tuesday, Sunday night, Monday night. And he said, now our pastors started using another version, Brother Danny, but he loves you. He listens to you all the time. And, he, and, it, and it's bothered him little by little by little. It, preachers begin to think, well, I'm not going to have nobody if I don't give here, give there, give here, give there. And what they're saying is the old-fashioned way of doing church ain't working. Well, let me remind you of something. God didn't call us to do what works. He called us to do what's right. What Noah did wasn't working too good either. 120 years, you know how many converts he had? None. His family, a, a, a crowd don't mean it's right or, or a little crowd don't mean it's right or wrong. You can't go by that. You go by what's right if it's a million, if it's five. Ain't that right? That's what you got to go by. So uh, I hope that you'll be ready for this tonight. Don't forget Saturday morning, we're going visiting. Really looking forward to that also. And I know everybody else. So let's have a little time of fellowship now. Everybody stand. Let's turn around and be friendly in the Lord. And after you do this for a minute, kids, you can uh, you can go. Okay, let's all stand, please. And get her. There she comes. Um, amen. Everybody turn around there and be friendly in the Lord there just a little bit. Can we get them lights back there? Mother Andy, go ahead and give me some volume. See what we got here. The presence of Christ glorified humanity with place. Heaven is a state and not a place. Do you hear that? That's Westcott and Hort, the guys who are responsible for those two manuscripts that I've been showing you on Wednesday night, the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus manuscripts. Amen. Go ahead, brother. Get the rest of them. Just leave them 
Oh, some one around the wall is real dim. There you go. On page 394, Westcott states, If Tennyson's idea of heaven was true, that heaven is the ministry of soul to soul, we may reasonably hope by patient, resolute, faithful, united endeavor to find heaven about us here, the glory of our earthly life. Westcott shows his love for Roman Catholicism on page 81 when he writes, after leaving the monastery, we shaped our course to a little oratory which we discovered on the summit of a neighboring hill, and by a little scrambling we reached it. Get me a little Fortunately, microphone. we found the door open. Ear mic. It is very small with one kneeling place, and behind a screen was a paeta, the size of life, i.e. a virgin and dead Christ. The sculpture was painted, and such a group in such a place and at such a time was deeply impressive. I could not help thinking of the fallen grandeur of the Romish church, on her zeal even in error, on her earnestness and self-devotion, which we might, with nobler views yeah. and a purer end, strive to imitate. Had I been alone, I could have knelt there for hours. Listen to that now. It truly is sad to think that an intelligent man like Westcott could not bring himself to believe in miracles or heaven. But Westcott and Hort were both involved in something far more sinister than textual criticism. In 1845, they joined the Hermes Club, in 1851, they formed the Ghostly Guild, which was followed by the Arenas Club in 1872. These clubs were involved in necromancy, or trying to make contact with dead spirits. These are the guys that are responsible for the Greek text of the NIV, RSV, ASV. People say, well, that's just an update of the King James. No, it had nothing to do with the King James actually had a bunch of junk in it they, they and left out a bunch of the real Bible. This is Westcott North. Why would two men who claim to be saved have such an interest in the spirit world? Good question. Should a Christian really trust a text or a Bible which can be traced back to these two men? Westcott and Hort's corrupt Greek text and their theories of textual criticism would go on to produce over 200 new versions in the next 120 years. With millions of King James Bibles in print, it would be impossible to destroy all of them. So if you can't destroy the King James Bible, then why not replace it with hundreds of corrupted counterfeits? Yep, that's what happened. Since 1881, an average of one new Bible has been released every year. Is the English language really changing this much? Or is there a darker agenda behind these new versions? Who would stand to profit the most if the King James Version passed out of common use? On October the 11th of 1962, the first session of the Second Vatican Council met in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Over the next few years, they plotted out the future of the Roman Catholic Church. In November of 1965, the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation was written. In chapter 6 and on page 112, we read, But since the word of God must be readily available at all times, the church with motherly concern sees to it that suitable and correct translations are made into various languages, especially from the original texts of the sacred books. If when the opportunity presents itself and the authorities of the church agree, these translations are made jointly with churches separated from us, they can then be used by all Christians. In 1989, one of the New International Version creators, whose name was Burton Goddard, would write the NIV story. He would describe the process that the NIV translators would use to create their new version. On page 96, Burton Goddard would reveal a shocking secret about the NIV. The magic of summers in Europe is indeed getting the job done, so the pattern continues. In 1976, the scene is the Collegio Mayor Monteleno, a residential unit of the University of Salamanca, fourth oldest university in Europe. An order of Catholic nuns operates the residence, and affectionate ties of Christian love soon bind the hearts of all together in a marvelous way. What is the University of Salamanca? 
It is one of the Roman Catholic Church's oldest universities. It is also one of the schools that trained Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. Here is a picture of a human skull that appears as a decoration on the outside of this university. Look at that thing. And what about the frog on top of the skull? Read Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 through 14 for more information. Yeah, that's right. The spirit, the unclean spirits like frogs. On page 97, Burton Goddard goes on to say, The summers in Europe make it possible for a collegiate translation to be produced within a relatively short span of time. In the process, they enrich the lives of translators and their families in a remarkable way in areas of history, culture, and scenic beauty. But more, they provide a practical day-by-day -day ecumenical experience beyond compare. Ecumenical means everybody get together. But what Greek text did the NIV translators use? Surely as professing Christians, they would have used the time-honored Textus Receptus, which by this time was backed up by over 99% of the extent. Look at that. It said the Textus Receptus. That's that one. The one we got our King James Bible from is backed up by 90% of all Greek manuscripts. But they were determined to base all the new Bibles on those. And I, you know what I think? I can't prove this, but I think that the whole, I think the, the, the Catholic Church and the Pope was behind all of the new Bible stuff to, to make, because the, the biggest enemy the Catholic Church ever had is the King James Bible. And they hated it, and so they can't get. You can't go around and collect them. There's billions of them, so you can put out a counterfeit to try to uh, make people leave it alone. It, it says, "Call no man your father." It tells you not to worship Mary. I mean, that thing it just tears it all to pieces. It's got Revelation 17 about that woman that rides a beast on the city that sits on seven hills. And there's no way in the world that can be any city in the world but Rome. It ruled over the people in the world, and when that was written. And the Catholic Bibles don't even have that in it. The, 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 the modern, the Catholic, the Greek text don't even have that in it. Manuscripts. On page 111 of the NIV, the making of a contemporary translation, we read, What is meant by New Testament? The so-called Textus Receptus, received text, is the Greek form of the New Testament that underlies the KJV translation. It is now almost universally recognized that the Textus Receptus contains so many significant departures from the original manuscripts of the various New Testament books that it cannot be relied on as a basis for translation into other languages. How what they said was the Textus Receptus, where your King James come from, has so many errors in it of a different the original Greek that you can't use it no more. They don't know what they they never seen the original Greek. They've never seen the original Greek. Nobody else has either. The original Greek faded out. When, when Jesus was in the synagogue and he was preaching and he said he turned to the scripture and the scripture said Jesus didn't have the original Greek. Jesus didn't have the actual papers that Moses wrote thousands of years before that. But he called it scripture and God promised to preserve his word. So if God promised to preserve his word, where is his word? I, you know, I know the answer to that. I hope you do too. Listen. NIV translators make such a claim when they have never seen the original manuscripts. Amen. On page 53, we read, What Greek text was used by the translators of the NIV New Testament? It was basically that found in the United Bible Societies and Nestle's printed Greek New Testaments, which contained the latest and best Greek text available. On page 55, the NIV translators admit to their use of the same two corrupt Roman Catholic manuscripts that were used by Westcott and Hort. They go on to say, This provides us with a more accurate Greek text of the New Testament than that found in the Textus Receptus. Let's take a look at some facts about these two manuscripts that the NIV translators don't want their readers to know about. Codex B, also known as the Vaticanus Manuscript, omits the following portions of scripture. Listen to this. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 through chapter 46 verse 28. Psalms 106 through 138. That's scripture that is not even in Sinaiticus. 
the Catholic Now, Listen, just you missed the first 46 chapters of Genesis. The whole, almost the whole book of Genesis. Matthew chapter 16, verses 2 and 3. The pastoral epistles. Hebrews chapter 9, verse... The pastoral epistles, y'all know what that is, don't you? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, Paul's epistles to the church. 14 through chapter 13, verse 25, and the entire book of Revelation. Don't even have it. And In 1844, accurate. Constantine von Tischendorf discovered the first pages of what would later become known as the Sinaiticus Manuscript. And where were these ancient pages of scripture? He found them in a pile of waste paper used to start fires at the monastery. But was there a reason that this ancient codex was destined for the fireplace? A few years after the discovery of the Sinaiticus manuscript, a man named Dr. Prebendary Scrivener was able to examine the document. This is what he wrote. The codex is covered with such alterations, i.e. alterations of an obviously correctional character brought in by at least 10 different revisers, some of them systematically spread over every page, others occasional or limited to separate portions of the manuscript, many of these being contemporaneous with the first writer, but for the greater part belonging to the 6th or 7th century. Another man named Dean John William Bergen was also able to examine the Sinaiticus manuscript. This is what he wrote. On many occasions, 10, 20, 30, 40 words are dropped through very carelessness. Letters and words, even whole sentences, are frequently written twice over or begun and immediately canceled. While that gross blunder whereby a clause is omitted because it happens to end in the same words as the clause preceding occurs no less than 115 times in the New Testament. A man named Herman Hoskier would compare the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus manuscripts and would reveal that these two codices actually contradicted each other over 3,000 times in the Gospels alone. Hey, he would up. write, I have tabulated the major part of these differences between Aleph and B in the Gospels and given the supporting authorities on each side. They amount to Matthew 656, Mark 567, Luke 791, John 1022 for a total of 3,036. They don't even agree with each other. Now, the Apocrypha, you should, I hope everybody knows what the Apocrypha is. Does everybody know? The Apocrypha was those books in between the Old Testament and New Testament. Like you ever heard the Catholic Bible say the lost books of the Bible? They'll have some on TV. You don't have, your Bible don't have all the books. The other time I was talking about the Apocrypha. And it means between, between the Testaments. It's not part uh, of the Word of God. And I'm... I'm, I hope y'all are not real bored. With, I, this guy's bland. He's dry as crackers. But he says something worth listening to if you can, if you can stand it for a few more minutes. If you look at a Catholic Bible, you will see that they... He's not really full of enthusiasm or personality, but, but he, <laughs> what he's saying, I'd hate to have to listen to you like that every day. I'd die. The other books as part of the inspired Old Testament text, books like Tobit, Judith, First and Second Maccabees, as well as Wisdom, Sirach, and Baruch. But where do these books come from? The truth is that the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus manuscripts both contain these apocryphal books as part of the inspired text. If versions like the New American Standard Bible and the NIV claim to be the most accurate translations of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, then why don't they include the apocryphal books? Amen. There's a great question, y'all. If these manuscripts were right, why didn't they include them in their Bibles if they really believed that? Yeah, I got the answer because nobody would buy them. You couldn't put them in the Christian bookstores and all the Christian in America went, it comes back down to love of money. That's what it comes back down to. I said, Lord, we can't put them in there. People won't buy them. Well, if it's part of the Word of God, they ought to be in there. And if it ain't, it ain't. A few years ago, the New Revised Standard Version did release an edition that contained the Apocrypha. This, of course, shouldn't be much of a surprise, seeing as how the New Revised Standard Version also has many Catholic editions available. Ain't that something? 
on page 1160 of this Catholic Youth Bible we read, So the next time you respond Amen at a Eucharistic celebration, know that you are saying yes to a special and life-giving relationship with God. Did you hear that? Might get it up just a tad, Ann. Uh, it said the next time you say Amen at the Eucharist. Chanel, are you in here? Or is she back there having the kids? Uh, who else is Catholic? Shauna's. And y'all know what the Eucharist is? It's communion, huh? There she is. Tell everybody what the Eucharist is, Sister, <laughs> the nun from New York. Go ahead. I reckon. Yeah. Right. The Catholic Church does. That's right. Makes you accountable. Amen. Phew. I want to go first. <laughs> Phew, man. That's nasty. Yeah, I've seen them do that. They walk around just open their mouth and the priest sticks it in your mouth. Uh, uh, now that's transubstantiation. They believe that it turns into consubstantiation. Do you, know, do you know what that is, George? Consubstantiation is, I didn't know what they'd done. It, is it Lutheran or Episcopalian you go to? I ain't going to tell nobody, I'm sorry. Is it Lutheran? Episcopalian? Consubstantiation does not believe that the thing turns into the body of Jesus, but the body of Christ is mystically present when you have the, the mass. And that's what that saying is. The next time you go to a mass and you say amen, what you're saying, you're saying yes to a spiritual relationship with God. In other words, when you take the mass, you're receiving Christ. That's why you ask somebody, have you ever took Christ your Savior? They kind of say, sure, I take him every Sunday. They think you do it through the mouth. We think he comes into your heart, not down your throat. Uh, and, and that's right. He comes in by faith through the heart. Okay? Watch this. People say, oh, there ain't no difference. There's a million miles of difference. This blasphemous Catholic practice of the Eucharist teaches that a priest has the power to transform a round wafer into the flesh of Jesus Christ. The faithful Catholic must then eat Jesus and drink his blood in the form of wine. The elements of bread and wine are not to be taken as symbolic, but rather as the literal flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. This is how a Catholic receives Christ. This mystical process of changing ordinary bread and wine into Jesus Christ is called transubstantiation. For many centuries, thousands of faithful Christian martyrs were executed by the Roman Catholic Church because they rejected the pagan sacrifice of the Eucharist. But today we have supposedly Protestant Bibles like the New Revised Standard teaching this Catholic heresy that resulted in thousands of Christians being burned alive. It is also interesting to note that in 1988, Rupert Murdoch purchased the New Revised Standard Version. He also owns and prints the NIV and the Satanic Bible. Isn't that weird? The same man owns... Rupert, how many of y'all ever heard of Rupert Murdoch? Man, he's like a super duper billionaire elite tire. I don't know. Or there ain't no telling what that man's into. I think he owns part of Fox News, but I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. Uh, owns the, the, the uh, Catholic Youth Bible, the NIV, and the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey. On LaVey. Just 10 years later, the Pope knighted Rupert Murdoch into the order of St. Gregory the Great. Wow. 
The Pope made him into some great order. Rupert Murdoch. Is this a coincidence? We spoke earlier of the fact that the NIV translators rejected the Textus Receptus and used the Nestle's text instead. So what is the story behind the Nestle's text? In 1898, a man named Eberhard Nessel would combine the Greek texts of Westcott and Hort, Tischendorf and Richard Francis Weymouth. Over the next 100 years, this Nessel's text would go through various editions and is known today as the Nestle Alon 27th edition. Now let's take a look at some of the men and women who have been involved in producing this Greek text. In 1952, a German named Kurt Alon would join the Nestle's team. He would assist in producing new editions of the Nestle's Greek text, his final being the 25th edition. He would eventually be joined by his wife, Barbara. I believe this photo shows who Kurt Alon was really serving. Now let's look at another man who was involved with the Nestle's text. His name is Bruce Metzger. Bruce Metzger was a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary. He was also one of the creators of the New Revised Standard Version. At his death in 2007, Princeton Theological Seminary would write, In 1993, Bruce Metzger presented a copy of the New Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition to Pope John Paul II at the Vatican. Bruce Metzger understood and was passionate about the significance of biblical translation for ecumenical dialogue. That's where those new versions come from. This article goes on to say, in 1972, he chaired the subcommittee that translated 3rd and 4th Maccabees and Psalm 151 for an expanded version of the Apocrypha. He personally presented this expanded version to His All Holiness Demetrius I in 1976. It was important to him that Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, and Protestant Christians be able to have recourse to a common biblical text as an instrument of unity. Here we see Demetrius I listed with Catholic priests. It is no secret that the Orthodox Church has been working with Roman Catholicism for a very long time. In this article, Archbishop Demetrius is said to be teaching at a Roman Catholic Jesuit University. Here we see the current Greek Orthodox Patriarch, Bartholomew I, meeting with Nancy Pelosi. Yeah, look at that. In this article, we can see what he is working to accomplish. His All Holiness has worked tirelessly for reconciliation among Christian churches and acquired an international reputation for raising environmental awareness throughout the world. He has worked to advance... Hear that? That's where all this environmental stuff comes from. There ain't no problem with the environment. The word, you don't have to worry about global warming. All that is is a reason to take people to, to keep people from making a living and, and by themselves and to stop free enterprise. And it's just a big bunch of junk to take from the rich and give to the poor. And the Pope's back in there somewhere, y'all. And Nancy, what's Nancy Pelosi doing hanging out with them? She's you know why they're they're fighting. And I'm not politicking right now. I'm not saying good or bad about her, Donald Trump, or nobody. But uh, there's a reason why they hate the Republicans so bad. There's a reason. Reconciliation with the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican Communion, as well as other confessions through theological dialogues and personal encounters with respective leaders in order to address issues of common concern. Why would a supposed Christian like Bruce Metzger work with and for these enemies of Jesus Christ. Now let's take a look at another member of the Nestle's team. His name is Carlo Maria Martini, and he is a Jesuit priest. In April of 2005, the BBC ran this article where they claimed that if elected, 
Cardinal Martin would be the first Jesuit to become Pope. However, a few weeks later, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger was chosen as the next Pope instead of Martini. On page 45 of the Nestle's 27th edition, we read, The text shared by these two editions was adopted internationally by Bible societies and following an agreement between the Vatican and the United Bible Societies, it has served as the basis for new translations and for revisions made under their supervision. This marks a significant step with regard to interconfessional relationships. It should naturally be understood that this text is a working text in the sense of a century-long Nestle tradition. It is not to be considered as definitive, but as a stimulus to further efforts towards defining and verifying the text of the New Testament. For many reasons, however, the present edition has not been deemed an appropriate occasion for introducing textual changes. One can only be left to wonder what the Jesuit Cardinal Carlo Martini has planned for the next edition of the Nestle's text. Next, we'll take a look at this Jehovah's Witness Greek interlinear New Testament. On pages 8 through 9, we read about what text is used by the Jehovah's Witnesses to produce their corrupt New World translation. The Greek text that we have used as the basis for the New World translation is accepted. Westcott and Hort text, 1881, by reason of its acknowledged excellence. But we have also taken into consideration other texts, including those prepared by D. Eberhard Nessel, the Spanish Jesuit scholar Jose Maria Bover, and another Jesuit scholar, A. Merck, the UBS text of 19... I took all of them into consideration, but the text is receptive. You know why? It teaches there's a hell. It teaches it right. The Jehovah Witnesses don't believe that. ...five and the Nestle Alan text of 1979 were consulted to update the critical apparatus of this edition. The preface of this Catholic... New American Bible shows that they also use the Nestle's text as the basis for their translation. It is important for you, the viewer, to realize that if you have a Bible version produced since 1881, Listen. then it can be traced back to this corrupt Nestle's Greek text. Y'all hear that now? Make sure you get that. If you have a Bible that came out after 1881, you can guarantee it come from the wrong Greek text. Listen to that. Jesuit plan to destroy the Protestant Reformation is no longer being carried out in secret. Today, the signs of Catholic infiltration are everywhere. Why would the Catholic News Agency report on the release of the newest NIV when the Council of Trent supposedly condemned the writings of Protestants? Maybe it is because Catholic websites openly promote and recommend. Look at this right here. I'm, I'm going to turn it off here in just a minute. Look at this life. I wish we could see the whole thing. Probably about 15, 20 minutes more. And I'll get uh, Brother Andy if, if make us some copies. If some two or three people have asked about getting a DVD, take it home and study it. Uh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, the stuff, if you go to the average bookstore now, like this one down here, 20 miles, you're going to find pro-Catholic stuff all through it. And what the Catholic Church says, hey, we can't fight it, so we'll just infiltrate it and take it back over and take everybody back to Rome. And ladies and gentlemen, um, that, that's why you will not find no chick tracks in the bookstore in Hickory. None. You won't find Clarence Larkin's books. You won't find any book that says anything negative about Rome in the bookstores anymore. The NIV. Ain't that something? Here on AmericanCatholic.org, Catholics are warned about the King James Version being woefully outdated. 
It said the King James Version is woefully outdated. The NIV is praised and is said to be an ecumenical translation. Yep. It is also interesting to note that the new revision of the NIV is to be completed in 2010 on the 400th anniversary of the Jesuit Dewey Reams Bible. It does, sir. But it isn't just Catholic websites promoting new versions like the NIV. Supposedly Protestant bookstores like ChristianBook.com are now selling Roman Catholic books and Bibles. Simply typing in the word Catholic in the search area netted 5,098 results. Here we see a book for Catholic girls that contains verses from the NIV. Or how about a book on the rosary? ChristianBook.com also sells the Catholic Catechism. Here on Berean Christian Store's website, you can see that they sell 2,483 Catholic-related items. Books like Born Fundamentalist, Born Again Catholic, or how about a book on the Holy Eucharist? Born Fundamentalist, Born Again Catholic. I think I got that backwards, ain't I? It's supposed to be the other way around. You was born a Catholic, then you got saved. But they done turn it around. How many of y'all heard them? These, these weirdos getting on there saying, I'm a recovering independent Baptist. You know, a bunch of bull like that. They're trying to make it sound like I saw the light and now we can dance and rock out all night. And I, I've seen the light. The Lord's moving in my life. No, <laughs> the devil shot you a curve is what's happened to you. That ain't the Lord. Here we see another supposedly Protestant website selling Roman Catholic. Joyce Myers side Catholic literature it is interesting to note that these three websites will not sell most of the books and materials that are available today which defend the King James Version see that sell pro-Catholic stuff and not pro-King James weird huh oh no chick tracks no 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 oh Jack Chick man he he told the truth about that outfit one can only be left to wonder who really runs these websites. Churches are returning to Rome, and that's exactly what we're seeing happen. Exactly. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it off here. I really, really wish y'all could see the rest of this. I know it's tedious, and you don't come to church on Wednesday night to see a movie, but just try to soak in a little bit of this. You want to see an ecumenical mess right here. The Roman Catholic Church meeting with all these leaders. F folks, this would have never happened 100 years ago. May I present Reverend Dr. Donald McCoy, representing the striding Bishop Mark Hansen of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. The Evangelical Lutheran Church. May I present Bishop Jeremiah J. Hart, Bishop of the New York Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. Kissing the Pope's hand. Ah, Lord. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Wesley Granberg Michelson, the General Secretary of the Reformed Church in America. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Dr. Clifton Kirkpatrick, the stated clerk of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in the United States. You talk about your holiness. What are you talking about? Your holiness. Somebody, you know who your holiness is? God. It ain't him. Lord have mercy. His breath stinks in the morning just like everybody else's. He's a sinner just like everybody else. He needs to get born again just like everybody else. Bible said, call no man on earth your father. He ain't my father. My father's in heaven tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Watch this, just for Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Dr. William J. Shaw, President of the National Baptist Convention of oh, the United States. Ain't that something? 
That's not the Southern Baptist. That's the National Baptist. Southern Baptist ain't got there yet. Your Holiness, may I present Bishop James Leggett, General Superintendent of the International Pentecost Holiness Church. Ain't that something, y'all? Crazy. Crazy. Your Holiness, may I present Dr. Leith Anderson, President of the National Association of Evangelicals. That's what they call us. All in the news and everything, they call us evangelicals. I got people say, well, you evangelicals. I don't even know evangelical. I don't even know what that is. I know what they mean by it. We are Bible-believing Christians. That's what we are. Bible-believing Christians. Yeah. Oh, that guy is? Holiness, may I present Bishop David H. Benke, President of the Atlantic District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Isn't it weird that they're all going back to him? They're all going back to the Pope? They're all going back to Rome? It's a carefully thought out plan for Rome to take back over. And that's stuff I'm going to be showing on Sunday night is falling right into the plan. You get rid of the Bible. You got to get rid of the Bible because that condemns it. You go by your experience. All present again. Now this is what we're going to study, but I'm not going to show it. This is what we're going to study starting Sunday night. For Lord's Day. Look at all them faiths all mixed in together. Coexist. That's where that Volkswagen passes you on there and these weird looking lesbian looking people driving it. You got them coexist bumper stickers. The leaders of the emergent church movement are now. And we're going to study this fellow. You can go ahead and get the last one, John. We, I know it's, it's, we're about running out of time. I'll have Andy, if, if you can, to make us some, uh, make us some coffee of this, but Lord, we, it's time to go, y'all. Them kids will be tearing the walls down back there, but this is Brian McLaren, and uh, we're going to learn a lot about him in the next few weeks. Now, I promise these Sunday night services will not be this boring <laughs> because we're going to mix it up a lot. But I thought just our Wednesday night crowd, you deeper life pillars of the church, mature Christians, would, 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 could get something out of this. Amen. The cream of the crop, bless God. All right. Uh, now, look, in, in summary, in closing tonight, what we've been trying to show here on the last few Wednesday nights is, where did our Bible come from? You say, well, what does it matter? Well, it matters a lot. I mean, a lot of people just take it and believe it, and that's it. And I, I envy people like that. But, my, you know, you might be like, well, how did it get here? Where did it come from? And it come from here. Uh, it come from here, I'm sorry. Textus receptus. That means received, recept, text, received text. Common people used it. That's a common man's Bible right there. And then the other versions came from Vaticanus and City Atticus. For 300 years in this country, everybody had the same Bible. And now they're, you have to go and ask for a King James in a lot of bookstores. So I hope this has been a little bit of a help to you. Um, I've got all kinds of brochures. We've got tracts, New Age Bible versions here by, oh, uh, uh, I thought that was Gail Ripplinger, but I'm not sure. That, that Ripplinger lady, she knows her stuff, man. I ain't kidding you. And so does William Grady. A lot of people can't swallow a Ruckman, so they take his stuff and stew it down so you can swallow it. But I, I like it straight. I'm a mainliner myself. I like the straight stuff, brother. Dr. Ruckman give it to you like nobody ever has or could. And so, uh, it, but you can get it from this New Age Bible version thing. This, uh, this is by Gail Ripplinger. She's a, she's a genius, really. Lord, she wrote some books. They're tremendous stuff on it. So uh, you're, it's out there. There's no excuse for being ignorant. All right? Anybody want to say something? Question? Add something? Ask something? Yeah, 
Yeah, there's, it's, I think that they're, like the book of Enoch, there's some of it that are good stuff, but it was never, it's not inspired by God. That's what I think. Just like that, just like that track I read, or the, I do a video or something could be really good, but not inspired by God. That's what I think. I think we've got all sixty-six books that God wanted us to have, and 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 the reason we believe that is because Jesus never quoted from the Apocrypha, and the Apocrypha don't claim to be inspired. It don't say, "Thus saith the Lord," is now, and the the Book of Isaiah. That 66 chapters of Isaiah fit the Bible. 27, I mean, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. There's a bunch of stuff like that. It just fits. And the church universally accepted the uh, the the canon there. But there, there's a big study on that. But that's a very, very good question. Because I hear people all the time say the book of Enoch said. Y'all see people on the internet are always quoting the book of Enoch. And there ain't no such thing as the book of Enoch in, in the Bible. There is one somewhere. Where'd you get? Where'd you get it at? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Anybody else got a question? Comment? Addition? Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Parish. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think it's wrong. Amen, Brother Frankie. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. Anybody else? Well, there's a lot. Let me let me remind you all this, y'all. There's a lot of good Catholic people. A lot. I mean, sometimes they live strict, de dedicated lives. It's like uh, like Brookman used to say, the only thing wrong with the Catholic is his church. A lot of them are good people, but their belief of that church is corrupt. But now... There's a lot of good Catholic people. People say, oh, I know a Catholic man. He gives to the poor, and, he, that, and, and they do. A lot, of, a lot of them live very, especially the older ones, good upstanding lives. But uh, the church itself is, a, is, a, um, is false. It's a false church. Anybody else? I just love listening to Dr. Rutgers' testimony, how he was trying to get find the Lord, so he got the Catholic priest guy. And the guy was like, well, let's get you through these classes and get you confirmed. Yeah. Well, meanwhile, he keeps seeking the Lord. And a few pile leads into the Lord. He starts reading the King James Bible. And that priest said, read that thing for me. You're going to see that the modern preachers that I'm going to show you in the next few weeks actually discourage Bible study because it creates too much division. So let's just leave it alone and all of us have a good time and clout and talk about how we should prosper and be in health. And they actually, especially eschatology. Eschatology is the study of future events, the rapture, tribulation. I mean, they all there's so much confusion about that. They say, just better off leave it alone. That ain't what Paul said. That ain't what he said. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Anybody else? Right quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you better watch it. That's true. That's true. 
Yeah. So you were snooping around in his account, see how much money he had? Are you allowed to do that when you work the bank? <laughs> his nose, he got, his nose got you in there, didn't he? <laughs> look, I'll look and see how much money he's got. All right. All minds and hearts clear. All right. All righty. Amen, brother. All right. Let's stand and uh, we'll pray. Uh, don't, don't miss now Sunday morning. Be here for Sunday school. Bring somebody with you. And then Sunday night, if the weather permits, we'll start on a video presentation. Now, I don't know. If it's bad, we'll put off one more week. Okay? All right. Let's pray tonight. Everybody just fellowship a little bit uh, before we go. Brian, won't you dismiss us?